online service this morning as we observe the 21st Sunday after Trinity. Uh, this morning, we will celebrate the Lord's Supper. If we have visitors with us, we're glad to have you. Uh, we ask our visitors if we do practice the historic Christian practice of closed communion. So any visitors who would like to commune in the future, I'd love to talk to you more about that at a later time. Just let me know after service. Uh, but we'll follow setting one this morning, and we'll begin with hymn number 905. Christ. 
forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The whole world is in your power, O Lord, King Almighty, and no one can gainsay you. For you have made heaven and earth. You are Lord of all. Blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. Confirm to your servant your promise, that you may be feared. Turn away the reproach that I dread, for your just decrees are good. Behold, I long for your precepts. In your righteousness, give me life. Gracious Lord. 
continual godliness, that through your protection she may be free from all adversities and devoutly given to serve you in good works, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. And the Old Testament lesson appointed for this Sunday is Genesis 1 and the beginning of Genesis 2. This long text will serve also as our sermon text. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. And God said, Let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse, and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse. And it was so. And God called the expanse heaven. And there was evening, and there was morning, the second day. And God said, Let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth, and the waters that were gathered together he called seas. And God saw that it was good. And God said, Let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seeds, and fruit trees bearing fruit in which is their seed each according to its kind on the earth. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed according to their own kinds, and trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning, the third day. And God said, Let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens, to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs, and for seasons, and for days and years, and let them be lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, and the lesser, night, the lesser light to rule the night, and the stars. And God set them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the fourth day. And God said, Let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the heavens. So God created the great sea creatures, and every living creature that moves, with which the waters swarm, according to their kinds, and every winged bird, according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful, and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening there was morning, the fifth day. And God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock and creeping things, and beasts of the earth according to their kinds. And it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds, and the livestock according to their kinds, and everything that creeps on the ground according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the 
image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth and every tree with seed and its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast on the earth and to every bird of the heavens and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. <coughs> Our epistle lesson is recorded in the letter to the Ephesians, chapter 6, reading from the 10th verse. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. And as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And let us rise. <laughs> Alleluia. Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be moved, but abides forever. Alleluia.
father knew that was the hour when Jesus had said to him, Your son will live. And he himself believed, and all his household. This was now the second sign that Jesus did when he had come from Judea to Galilee. This is the gospel of the Lord. Confess our faith together in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light. Very God of very God, begotten, not made, made of one substance with the Father, by whom 
from the Lord Jesus Christ. Moments ago, we read all of Genesis 1 and the first three verses of Genesis 2. And this long text, this familiar text, supplies enough material for many and varied sermons. We could consider the act of creation and how it demonstrates both the wisdom and power of God, and how it stands in contrast to popular human theories. Or we might focus on the place of mankind within the creation, the blessings of the image of God, and of work, and of marriage, and of family. Or we could simply marvel at the beauty and the wonder of creation itself, and thank the Lord for how beautiful and wonderful it remains for us, even under the corruption of sin and death. And we could remind ourselves of our responsibility to care for the world over which the Lord has given us responsibility. But on this particular morning in particular, we turn our attention to the Creator Himself, to who He is, to how He operates. We consider today the powerful word of God. First, we contemplate the spoken word. Through the spoken word, God creates. We see in the Genesis 1 account, God creating all things by his powerful word. God the Father simply speaks, and what he says becomes reality. And God said, let there be light, <coughs> and there was light. And God said, let there be an expanse, and God made the expanse. And God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered up into one place, and let the dry land appear, and it was so. And God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, and it was so. And God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons, for days and years. Let them be lights in the expanse of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God said, let the waters swarm with living creatures and let birds fly on, above the earth. So God created great sea creatures and every living creature that moves with which the waters swarm and every winged bird. And God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures, and it was so. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. So God created man in his own image. Again and again, God the Father simply speaks, and his word becomes reality. Now already, at the very beginning of this book of Genesis, we notice something extraordinary about our creator God. The Hebrew word, Elohim, which we translate God, is a plural word. You wouldn't notice this in English, but what you would notice is that according to verse 26, God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Let us make man in our image. God refers to himself in the plural. And these plural references to God would remain a puzzling mystery to us if we had no other passages of Scripture to shed light on the divine being. But from elsewhere, we know that God is triune, three divine persons in one divine being. We read in the first verse of the Bible, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Here we see God the Father. Immediately after, we read in the second verse of the Bible, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Here we see God the Holy Spirit. Now John, the evangelist, writes not an account of the creation of the universe, strictly speaking, but he does begin his account of the life of Christ with a brief commentary on the creation. Why would he begin his biography of Christ with the creation and not with the genealogy of Christ or the conception of Christ or the birth of Christ? Well, later in the book, John records these words of
of Jesus, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. John realizes that Jesus existed before his birth, before his conception, even before his own ancestors. Jesus was active in the creation of the world. Therefore, John begins his gospel, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And here we see God the Son, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And so we contemplate the incarnate word. Through the incarnate word, God redeems. Notice that we are using that word, word, in a different way now. The word in this sense is not what Jesus says, but what he is. And yet we notice a mysterious connection between the incarnate word, Jesus, and the spoken word of the Father. Remember that the Father created all things through his spoken word, God said, and it was. But then consider what John writes concerning the incarnate word, Jesus. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Moses writes in Genesis, that God created the world through his spoken word. John writes in his gospel that God created the world through Jesus, the word. Other inspired writers make similar statements. According to the writer to the Hebrews, In these last days God has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. Through Jesus, through the word. God created the world. Solomon in the book of Proverbs refers to Jesus as wisdom when he writes, The Lord by wisdom founded the earth. Later he writes in more detail from the perspective of Jesus, The Lord possessed me at the beginning of his work, the first of his acts of old. Ages ago I was set up at the first, before the beginning of the earth. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no springs abounding with water, before the mountains had been shaped, before the hills, I was brought forth. Before he had made the earth with its fields, or the first of the dust of the world, when he established the heavens, I was there. When he drew a circle on the face of the deep, when he made firm the skies above, when he established the fountains of the deep, when he assigned the sea its limit, so that the waters might not transgress his command, when he marked out the foundations of the earth, then I was beside him like a master workman, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing bef before him always, rejoicing in his inhabited world, and delighting in the children of man. Here again we see Jesus Christ, the Word, taking an active role in the creation of the universe. Now, historically, some groups have mistakenly thought that on the basis of Proverbs 8, which we just heard, Jesus is not eternal God, but was created in time. This was the teaching of Arius and his followers, the Arians. And this is the teaching today of the Jehovah's Witnesses. When they read these words of Jesus, The Lord possessed me at the beginning of his work, the first of his acts of old. They conclude that this means Jesus was created after time had begun, but just before the creation of the world. Now the Hebrew word here translated as possessed, the Lord possessed me. Some have translated it as created. It could mean acquired, it could even mean fathered so that it would read, the Lord fathered me. And with the historic Christian church, we teach the scriptural truth that Jesus Christ is begotten of the Father. That means Jesus Christ is the Son of the Father. The opponents appeal also to the phrase, 
Ages ago I was set up at the first, before the beginning of the earth. Before the beginning of the earth is a reference to eternity. In other words, Jesus Christ, the Word, is eternal. He always was, He always is, He always will be. In other words, He is Yahweh. I am who I am. He is begotten of the Father, not in time, but in eternity. The Father always has been the Father. The Son always has been the Son. With the historic Christian church, we teach the scriptural truth that Jesus Christ is eternally begotten of the Father. Now John tells us more about this word through whom all things were made. He writes, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus, the eternal word, became incarnate. He became human. He took on a human body and soul. Becoming one of us in every way, but without sin. John explains, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Just as God created physical light at the creation of the world, and just as that light pierced the darkness, so God created spiritual light in the incarnation of the Word, and that light pierced our spiritual darkness and gave us life. John goes on to say, The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. The word became flesh. The word became incarnate in order to redeem us. Jesus lived under the law, obeying it perfectly in our place. Jesus served our sentence, suffering and dying for all our sins. Jesus became a son of man in order to make us sons of God. Just as God has created us and all things by his powerful spoken word, God has redeemed us by his powerful incarnate word, Jesus Christ. God reveals to us his great power and his great wisdom in the creation of the world through his spoken word. God reveals to us his great power and his great wisdom in the redemption of mankind through his incarnate word. And God reveals to us his great power and his great wisdom also in the sanctification of his chosen people through his written word. And so thirdly, we contemplate the written word. Through the written word, God sanctifies. Consider that the same Spirit of God, who was hovering over the face of the waters at the creation of the world, was hovering over the face of the waters at your baptism, placing the name of triune God upon you, connecting you to your Savior, and marking you as a redeemed child of God. This is sanctification. Having been set apart from the fallen world as a special possession, a servant, a child of God, set apart for salvation in Christ, set apart for good works. Consider the great power and wisdom of the written word of God Jesus says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. And the writer to the Hebrews tells us that the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, 
of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And the Lord also says through Isaiah, So shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose, and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. What is the thing for which he sent it? Well, the written word of God has the power to convert us from unbelief to saving faith. Paul explains, For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. And also faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. The written word guides us in sanctified living. Paul writes, All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. We confess with the psalmist, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. The written word guides us in holy living. And we have not graduated from the Word of God, but we continue to grow in it. Moses says, man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. We need the written Word of God as daily bread for our souls. Paul writes, when you received the Word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the Word of men, but as it really was, as it really is, the Word of God, which is at work in you believers. So never be fooled by the lowly messenger who proclaims the Word of God to you. It is not his Word. It is the Word of the Lord. Next Sunday, as we celebrate the Reformation, we will hear these words of Jesus. If you abide in my Word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, the truth will set you free. Our desire as believers is not to hear the word once or twice and then move on with our lives. No, our desire is to abide in the word, to live in it, to grow in it, to proclaim it to others. Through the spoken word, God creates. Through the incarnate word, God redeems. Through the written word, God sanctifies. Thanks be to God. Amen. At this time we'll sing hymn number 583.
seizure and was rushed to the emergency room as well. Uh, the last update was about an hour ago she went into surgery, and so we'll keep her in our prayers certainly as well. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, enlighten our minds by your Holy Spirit, that we may always hear, read, and receive your word with thankfulness and devotion. We thank you for your infinite mercy in the gift of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, for our salvation. Grant that we may believe this good news of Christ crucified for us with all our hearts, and give it free course in our lives. Grant unto us a spirit of confidence in prayer, so that in faith we may always seek your blessings for all our needs, bringing to you our supplications for loved ones and for all people, and always trusting in your goodness to fulfill our joy, since we have been made yours and through Christ our Lord. O Lord, look down from heaven, behold, visit and relieve your servant, Pastor Dow, for whom we pray. Look upon him with the eyes of your mercy, and give him comfort and sure confidence in you. Defend him from every danger to body and soul, and keep him in peace and safety. Father of all mercy, you never fail to help those who call upon you in faith. Give strength and confidence to your servant Laura in her time of affliction. Grant that she may know that you are near, and that, under, and that underneath her are your everlasting arms. Grant that she, resting on your protection, may fear no evil, for you are with her to comfort and deliver her. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Dear Lord, uphold your church, that we may be maintained in the true faith and confession of your holy name. Strengthen us so that we may worship you with pure hearts, serving you and those around us in love. Raise up pastors and missionaries who will honor their calling by a godly life and feed your flock with your true word. O oh Lord, bless this great nation in which we live. Give your guidance, understanding, and integrity to the President and Congress of our land, as well as the governors and legislatures of the states and to all those in authority. All these things we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, your only begotten Son, who by his suffering, death, and resurrection has given to us the certain promise of eternal life and the boldness of purpose to proclaim his name to all people. In that name we pray. Amen. And I will sing the offertory.
that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who, having created all things, took on human flesh and was born of the Virgin Mary. For our sake he died on the cross and rose from the dead to put an end to death, thus fulfilling your will and gaining for you a holy people. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying,
who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. You may be seated as we sing the remaining two verses of hymn number 578. 